grace. I want to send you grace. I want to receive grace. This is John R. Berg, and we're learning in this Advent season about radical acceptance, the power of a posture of openness and willingness and yes to life, and that's rooted in God's grace for us, God's radical acceptance for us. That's why there's such power in that posture, and a lot of folks who may write about it from a secular or therapeutic perspective may not understand the reason, the foundation for uh, what that dynamic can release in our lives is that we were made, the will was made to surrender to God. And God's acceptance for us is all summed up in that little word grace. And I really need that. I don't know about you, there'll be times, there'll be days when something happens, there's a conversation or something comes in writing and it touches such a point of pain, so much anger or sadness inside me then I'm aware I, I can't handle this. I don't know how to. God, I need your grace to keep me from messing things up. And this is one of those days for me, and it may be for you. There's never a day when we don't need God's grace and when it isn't all around us. And that's the message of this season. God comes to us in the person of Jesus to give us grace. So I want to talk about receiving that and the nature of it and the messiness of grace. Several weeks ago, I mentioned a book by, edited by Robert Emmons, and it had a picture on the cover, and uh, I, I showed it on the video, and somebody wrote back afterwards, that, that picture on the cover looks like uh, a picture that's called Grace. So I looked up that picture on Grace online. It's slightly different than the one that was on the book cover, but it's a very, very famous picture, and you've probably seen it. It was taken by a photographer, a Swedish artist named Eric Enstrom, all great Artists tend to be Swedish, Picasso, Da Vinci, Beethoven. And in this case, he met another guy from Sweden, Charles Wilden. This is in Minnesota 100 years ago. And he thought that Wilden would be a great model for a picture of prayer. So he asked if he would pose for it. And in this picture, you see this old white-haired man with these old gnarled hands clasped together in prayer sitting in front of a little wooden table with a little loaf of bread and a great big thick Bible with his spectacles on it. And he looks so earnest. And we tend to compare our insides with other people's outsides. And when you look at that picture, at least for me, I tend to think, man, I wish I could pray like that. It turns out that the actual story of the people involved is quite different in a way that I think kind of illumines our subject. Charles Wyden, not a lot is known about him, but he had a difficult life. Uh, he was described as a ne'er-do-well 100 years ago, apparently didn't have a great work ethic, worked as a peddler, trying to sell stuff like boot scrapers door-to-door, -door, lived in a sod hut, had drinking problems. The only official documentation left from his life is a certificate of divorce that he got right around when that picture was taken. And in fact, his wife was so upset with him that later on, when the picture became famous and one of the relatives in the family hung the picture in the house, the wife was very upset about that. Like, I don't want to have to go in there and look at that guy's face. And it turns out that that big thick book in the picture that uh, looks like a Bible, is supposed to look like a Bible, was in fact, apparently a dictionary. And Charles Wilden signed away all of his rights to that thing for five bucks. So what you're looking at when you look at that very pious looking picture is a divorced, uh, low work ethic, pretty low functioning, high family conflict guy with a drinking problem whose hands are clasped over a dictionary. And it's called grace. And I kind of love that. It speaks very deeply to people. A publishing house, religious publishing house named Augsburger eventually bought it and it's, it's uh, hung up on walls all around the world. It was done around 1920 after the First World War and the Spanish influenza pandemic that killed actually many, many, many more millions than had been killed by the COVID. Uh, pandemic in our day and people were looking for hope. They were looking for something that says there is somebody watching over us. There is grace available. And I kind of love the story of that picture because it's a reminder of what a messy thing grace is and how part of the story of Christmas is that God doesn't use any of the people that we would expect him to in this story. 
doesn't go to the religious or educational elite in Israel. Not a story about a king like Herod or Caesar Augustus. It's just uh, this impoverished, uneducated young woman named Mary, who's not even married yet, and her frightened husband Joseph, and an old couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who had given up on being able to have children long ago, but will give birth to John the Baptist, and a bunch of pagan wise men that show up, and these shepherds who are at the bottom of the status totem pole. And of course, the unlikeliest of all, this little child in a manger, Jesus. And that's grace. I was thinking about that and reading these words from Dallas Willard's book, The Divine Conspiracy, about how it is that we're able to live. And he writes, it is only pity or mercy that makes life possible. We don't like to hear it, but human beings at their best are pitiable creatures that walk in a vain show, Psalm 39. Only God's mercies keep us from being consumed because of our sins. But as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities us. He knows what we are made of. He remembers that we are dust. This is the wonderful healing nature of the kingdom among us. Once we step into this kingdom and trust it, pity becomes the atmosphere in which we live. Of course, it is his pity for us that allows us in to start with, and then it patiently bears with us. The Lord is bursting with compassion and full of pity, James 5.11. But we also are to be, this is First Peter, of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. It is not psychologically possible for us really to know God's pity for us and at the same time be hard-hearted toward others. And then Dallas goes on. Today, we sometimes speak of people who cannot forgive themselves. We've talked about that before. Usually, however, the problem is much deeper. More often than not, these are people who refuse to live on the basis of pity. The problem is not that they are hard on themselves, but that they are proud. And if they are hard on themselves, it's because they are proud. They don't want to accept that they can only live on the basis of pity from others. And then this. And if you've been squeaming as you read this, there's a good reason. I have used the word pity through much of the discussion of God forgiving our sins, rather than the word mercy or the even more dignified compassion. That is because only pity reaches to the heart of our condition. The word pity makes us wince, as mercy does not. Our current language has robbed mercy of its deep traditional meaning, which is practically the same as pity. To pity someone now is to feel sorry for them, and that is regarded as demeaning, whereas to have mercy now is thought to be slightly noble. Just give them a break. Today, even many Christians read and say, forgive us our trespasses as, give me a break. In the typically modern era, uh, this saves the ego and its egotism. I'm not a sinner, I just need a break. But no, I need more than a break. I need pity because of who I am. If my pride is untouched when I pray for forgiveness, I have not yet prayed for forgiveness. In the model prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask for pity with reference to our wrongdoings. Without it, life is hopeless. And with it comes the gift of pity as an atmosphere in which we can then live. This is a show um, way, way low on the sophistication rung. None of you will have ever watched it or probably heard of it, but I used to watch it when I was a kid called the Beverly Hillbillies. And the central character in it, Jed Clampett, had a few stock phrases. One of them was just a summation of the human condition. Pitiful, he would say, pitiful. We'd say that around my house sometimes when I was growing up. Jethro's cluelessness, or Granny's temper, or Mr. Drydale's pitiful. And that's me. And somehow when I remember how pitiful I am in my ego, in my self-centeredness, 
in my fear, uh, in the way that I'm just consumed with what it is that I want. Somehow, when I remember that and remember that God loves me by His grace, then it helps me to live in pity and receive pity and then to remember that I will be loved by my wife, by my children, by my friends on the basis of their pity. Not only their pity, but their pity for sure. I am pitiful, but I have a God who is full of pity. And so I can embrace that and live in it. And so it comes to Charles Wilden and that old picture called grace. So it comes to you. And so we can be vehicles of it to other people. That is the season we're in. That is the God we serve. So today, live in the pity of God. In God's care for you and for me with all of our flaws, all of our brokenness. It's like that old man sitting at the table, that's me too. That's where we live. I'll see you tomorrow.